All right. Today is Wednesday, April 13th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's dive right into it. In focus. Peak inflation, you say? Well, the facts disagree. Let's start by this. The entire media cabal and the economists, so-called economists and analysts and strategists and douchebaggerists, whatever they are, they're all coming out of the woodwork right now talking about peak inflation. Inflation is peaking. Did you talk to a psychic or something? You looked into your crystal ball? How about the alignment of Jupiter and Uranus? Maybe that's a telltale, right? For peak inflation. But they're all into this conspiracy right now. The New York Times says, has US inflation peaked? Question mark. And they have to add the question mark, by the way, as an insurance policy. Meaning, if they get it wrong next month, they say, we did not say peak inflation is here. We were just uh, asking a question. And look at how many propagandists they got out to write this piece. Here is CNN. CNN says, did US inflation peak in March? Question mark. Americans are concerned. Or you think? And here is Reuters. Reuters says, broad inflation little relief for Fed, but peak may be near. At least Reuters are not using the question mark thingy. But here is Market Watch, and Market Watch says, peak inflation question mark. The worst may be over, but Americans to keep paying a high price. And this is what I said today, folks. The peak inflation narrative is an organized effort to prop up equities. Then when they get it wrong next month, they're just going to say, oops, I did it again. Meanwhile, when we get something wrong, when we go outside of the narrative, for example, we get censored, we get banned, we get labeled as uh, misinformation and Russian propagandists. But when the media floats up all of these unfounded conspiracies in an organized effort to prop up equities, that's okay. You think it is a coincidence that all of them right now saying peak inflation, question mark, you really think that that is a coincidence? Well, you gotta be a child believe that. And just a reminder for you, when they talk about peak inflation, well, it is easy to manufacture peak inflation, meaning cooking the data. They could come out next month and say, hey, inflation month over month is down 1%, 2%, whatever it is. And here we go, peak inflation, it's over. Let's pop the champagne and go crazy. Yet, at the end of the day, will the prices that you and I pay, the average American consumer, will these prices also go down when they say peak inflation? Well, here is Dr. Evil, Jerome Powell, explaining to you that when they say inflation is about to go down or went down or peaked or was transitory, that doesn't mean that prices are going to go down. Take a listen. The concept of transitory is really this. It is that uh, the increases will happen. We're not saying they will reverse. That's not what transitory means. It means that the increases in prices will happen. So there will be inflation, but that the process of inflation uh, will stop so that so that there won't be further. Inf when, we, when we think of inflation, we really think of inflation going up year upon year upon year upon year. That's inflation. When you have inflation for 12 months or whatever it may be, I'm just taking an example. I'm not making an estimate. That, then you have a price increase but you don't have an inflation process. And so part of that just is it, that if it doesn't affect longer term inflation expectations, then it's very likely not to, infect, uh, to, to affect the process of inflation going forward. So uh, what, what I mean by transitory is just something that doesn't leave a permanent mark on the inflation process. Again, we don't mean, I don't mean that, 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 that you know, producers are going to take those price increases back. That's that's not the idea. It's just that they won't go on indefinitely. And of course, the peak inflation crowd is saying, here is the evidence. Look at the two-year yield, for example. It is topping. It is moving down. And hence, the inflation scare, that's over now. The Fed tightening scare, that's over now. Put your blindfolds on and buy stocks. Buy, buy, buy. And then came the smack in the mouth right away. And you cannot ignore this one. You cannot say that this is peak inflation when you have this piece of data. Anybody who tells you that is lying to you. Today, we got supplier prices, wholesale prices, and they rose 11.2% year over year last month. And this is the biggest gain on record, the biggest gain in history, we've never seen this level of inflation before. 11.2%. And mind you, 
This is the cooked data. This is not the real data. This is the kitchen's data, the bureau of labor statistics. But even with that, look at that PPI. This is not a chart of oil, Bitcoin, or even GameStop. This is the PPI, the producer price index. Look at this chart and tell me with a straight face that we are at peak inflation. Tell me with a straight face that we don't have an economic problem here. This is the largest spike that we've ever seen. How could you ignore that? But of course, it's easy when you use propaganda by brainwashing the public as if this is the 1950s when, oh, the guy on TV said, the guy on the radio said, it must be true. We got the internet now, but the propaganda keeps going on from peak inflation to the Putin price hikes. And maybe now they can dismiss the PPI as the Putin price increase. Yep. And if you say inflation is peaking, this is bad news for you. Wall Street and Main Street are looking for any sign that the highest U.S. inflation in 40 years is cooling off. They did not get any in the Marsh Report on Wholesale Prices. Another huge increase that points to more price pressures and problems ahead. Why? Because the PPI is a leading indicator for the CPI. The producers pay the prices, they manufacture these products, and then they send them down to us, the consumer. So if the PPI says... 11.2%, soon enough the CPI, which is a lagging indicator, would be at 11.2% if not more. Here's another explanation for you from Julian Bergden, who said, Equity bulls are yet again jumping on the idea of inflation peaking. We do not see it as long as the PPI keeps surging. Instead, we have two options. Number one, companies eat the price increases, and that equals margins collapse. Number two, they pass them on, which means higher inflation, which also means more hikes. A more hawkish Fed, neither good for stocks. Because if margins go down, earnings will go down too. And stocks cannot ignore the fundamentals for too long. And as he said, if they pass those price increases, then we will see more inflation and more hikes. Not good for stocks, but also crushes the entire narrative of peak inflation. How could you say that this is peak inflation after we got the PPI data today? You cannot say that with a straight face unless you're a propagandist or brain-dead zombie, or perhaps both. Here's uh, Stephanie Link, and she says, Marsh PPI, 1.4% month over month, and 11.2% year over year. February, the rating for February, was revised higher by 0.2%. The intermediate inflation is over 20%. Once again, the intermediate inflation is over 20%. Enough with the peak inflation discussion. And she's right. The peak inflation discussion is garbage. You have zero evidence that we have peak inflation. You might say, what about used cars? And I exposed that to you in details in yesterday's video. That used cars prices are going to move higher again. And this is the most shocking piece of data that we got from the PPI today. Look at this. This is absolutely insane, by the way. The PPI, month over month, all in all, was 2.4%. The most since May. This is for food, by the way. But look at this. The month-over-month -month inflation for fresh and dry vegetables month-over-month -month is up 40 2.4%. Yep, once again, inflation for fresh and dry vegetables month over month went higher by 42.4%. Is this Zimbabwe? Is this the Weimar Republic? No, it's not. It is the United States of America in 2022. About grains, up 16.1% month over month. Cooking oils, up almost 10% month over month. Chickens might look cheap for now, but watch out, we have a new strain of the flu, and millions of chickens are being killed right now, so the prices of poultry will move higher and higher and higher. How could you say this is peak inflation, when the month over month inflation in vegetables went higher by over 42%, and this is the screen grab, by the way, from the PPI, just so you know that we're not making it up. This is insane. This is We've never seen anything like this before. Not even in the 1970s. And it gets even worse. Look at the final demand for wheat, for example. Month over month. We're not talking year over year, folks. Month over month, up over 24%. And year over year, it is up over 70%. Tell me again, this is peak inflation. I'll smack you right in the mouth. Peak inflation is garbage. Peak inflation is one of those cheesy pickup lines that you use in a bar when you're really drunk, when you're looking to get slapped in the mouth or having a drink thrown at you. The moment I saw you, I got some peak inflation in my pants. But in reality, in economics, 
when you say peak inflation, you're nothing but a fool. You're a clown. What is your data, by the way? What is your evidence for peak inflation besides speculation? You got nothing. Or the two year went down because the two year was not technically extended and was begging for a pullback. Or the market rallied higher on peak inflation. Was it really on peak inflation or was it because of low volume and a shortened trading week? Here is more evidence against you, by the way. Today we got the small business index, but here it is from the Wall Street Journal. In another signal of acute price pressure, some 72% of small businesses in March reported raising their average selling price, or net, the highest in 48-year history of the survey conducted by the National Federation of Independent Businesses. And pay attention now, some 50% of respondents said they plan to raise prices in the next three months, up four percentage points from February, according to the survey, which was released on Tuesday. The share of small businesses flagging inflation as their single most important problem jumped to 31%, the highest since 1981. So again, you have 50% of small businesses saying, oh, we're going to increase prices in the next three months at least. So how could you say this is peak inflation when you have small businesses saying we're going to increase prices in the next few months? When you have Albertson's earnings, for example, a grocery chain who came out and said, we see higher prices, not lower prices in the future. The shipments that we're getting right now, well, they're charging more. You think Albertson's is going to eat the bag here and crush their margins? Of course not. They're going to pass that inflation all the way down to you and I, the consumer. So once again, how could you say that this is peak inflation? Look at German Boons, for example. You think this surge higher, this massive reversal higher, is peaking and it's about to go down again? Really? It might face some technical resistance at some point, that's for sure. But a rise like this is something like we've never seen before. And it tells you that we have a bigger problem here. And I know I said yesterday that the USA will beat Germany in inflation. Actually, in reality, give it about two months and the Germans will beat the United States in inflation. When we talk about peak inflation and it is time to buy equities because inflation is peaking, yada, yada, yada. How could you say that with a straight face? Because look at this chart, for example. In white, the CPI minus the unemployment rate. In blue, the Fed funds rate. Every time we've seen a massive gap between the white and blue lines, the Fed funds rate in blue surged higher to catch up with the white line, which is CPI minus the unemployment rate. In other words, the Fed is way behind the curve. They need to spike up those Fed funds rate, perhaps to the same levels back in the 1980s to tackle this inflation. What do you think will happen to the equities market when the Fed does that? Another one. Look at the real Fed funds rate. It's in the toilet. The lowest Fed funds rate in history. At the same time, we have the highest inflation in 40 years. Does this make sense at all? Of course not. Meaning the Fed can play these psychological games all they want, but sooner or later, they're going to have to face the music. And if they don't start to act aggressively right now, they're going to have to do so later on. And they're going to have to be even more aggressive. They have to normalize the Fed funds rate. And that means pushing that Fed funds rate for at least above 5%. Bullard says 3.5%. I say bullshit. 5% at a minimum. And even if you do that, you're still way behind the curve. There is no other way to look at it. Another one. When we look at the Atlanta Fed flexible CPI, for example, we have the 12 month in white and then the one month in blue. We are seeing inflation that we've never seen before, even in the 1970s in the flexible CPI. This is unbelievable, folks. The biggest crisis in history. And when we look at the sticky CPI, the 12 month in white and the three month in blue. Sticky CPI means things like wages, for example. We are seeing the highest inflation that we've ever seen since the 1980s. Is there any sign in this chart right now that inflation is peaking? Of course not. If anything, this is a sign to sound the alarm. Look at rents. Why are we talking about rents? Rental inflation is at 31 year high. And this is the cooked data, by the way, the 4.4%. But why is this inflation important? Look at the contrast between the CPI for rents in blue and the Zillow rent index. Usually there's a lag. The CPI lags real data when it comes to rental inflation. What does that mean? We're going to see rental inflation moving higher in the next CPI and perhaps the one after that and the one after that to catch up with what you see right now, which is the real inflation rate according to Zillow, regardless of the manipulation efforts by the cooks. What does that mean? If rent inflation is about to move higher, and it is a massive component of the CPI, you really think the CPI is going to peak? We are at peak inflation right now. What 
are you smoking? Because I'd like to have some of that. And lastly, when we talk about the equities market, for example, they're saying it's peak inflation, buy the dip, we're going higher, the moon is coming. Here's the problem. Don't look at the labels of this chart, by the way. Just look at the correlation between the light blue and the dark blue colors. Is there a correlation? Would you say that? The answer is clear, yes. There is clear correlation between the two. Well, the light blue line is the net percentage expecting a stronger economy. The dark blue is overweight equities, the percentage who are overweight equities. Well, expectations for a stronger economy is pretty much at all-time lows. We've never seen these kind of readings since October 2008. And I wonder what happened back then. I cannot remember. Hmm. What happened back in 2008? I can't really remember. But anyways, if this is true, if the correlation holds, then the dark blue color, which is overweight equities, will catch up with the light blue color, and it's going to go down to negative, meaning we have another shoe to drop in the equities market, a big one. So why are they pumping right now? Why are the predators pumping right now? Is it because of elections and they're worried about a lower stock market? If that is the case, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to lose the elections either way. But if the manipulation effort is meant to lure the retail crowd, for example, to buy the dip and push the equities higher, the indices higher, I should say, so the insiders and the pumpers can get out at better prices, then this is business as usual, right? After all, this is the jungle we call the stock market. Predators all over the place looking for praise. Why? Because the SEC remains in a coma. The regulators remain in a coma by design, of course. And the stock market is wide open for the 1%, for the insiders, for the oligarchs to take advantage of the little guy. And this peak inflation garbage is just another manipulation effort to take advantage of the little guy. And with that, folks, we're going to move on here and cover the market information for you. And we start with the performance of indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 344.23 points or a gain of 1.01%. The Nasdaq also in the green, the leader for the day up 272.02 points or a gain of 2 0.03%. The S&P 500 up 49.14 points or a gain of 1.12%. Moving on to the sector's performances, leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medals, cyclicals, and number two for the silver technology, number three for the bronze materials. We're not going to shame any of the laggers today because every single sector of the market managed to close in the green. But here's the problem. In legitimate rebounds, we usually see a rotational element, meaning moving from winners to losers in a significant way, moving from one sector to the other in a significant way, in a consistent manner, meaning for a few days, a few weeks, it becomes a clear pattern. And this is not what we're seeing for now. We're seeing these spikes higher for a few days, the tide that lifts all boats, massive rebounds for the indices on technical basis, for example. You cannot trust those rebounds. We got to see a legitimate rebound from energy, materials, the defensives, utilities, all the way back to technology, for example, for us to say that this is a legitimate rebound, a legitimate ratty in the Nasdaq, for example. And this is not what we're seeing, at least not for now. What about the advance to decline ratios, NYSE, 81% advancing versus 15% declining. The Nasdaq, 74% advancing versus 22% declining. Be it that, the 52-week lows were 154 versus only 37 new 52-week highs. So underneath it all, the breadth in the Nasdaq remains awful. Moving on to commodities, you want to talk about peak inflation, look at this map, for example. Do you see peak inflation anywhere? Maybe uh, in the VIX, perhaps? But we're not seeing it in actual commodities. For example, energy commodities, well, the WTI closed the day with gains of over 3.5%. Brent also closing the day with gains of almost 4%. Gasoline closed the day with gains of over 4.5%. Look at this. Heating oil closing the day with gains of over 8 and 3 quarters of a percent. Natural gas adding another 5% or so by the end of the day, and now trading above 7 bucks. So again, where is peak inflation? What are you talking about when you say peak inflation? What about softs? Lumber in the green. So was OJ. The rally in OJ is absolutely impressive. OJ closing the day with gains of almost 6%. 
Likewise, cotton gaining almost 3% today alone, while we have cocoa and sugar pretty much flat. Coffee was the decliner of the day, losing over 3.25% today. Metals, muted yet positive activities for both gold and silver, but we have gains, sizable ones, for platinum. Platinum closed the day with gains of over 1.5%, while we have modest losses for copper, and the decliner for the day was palladium, losing about one and three quarters over percent. Yet a reminder, palladium gained over 9% last Friday alone. Meats, what's going on here? Muted across the board, the loser is lean hogs after a rebound, a massive one of over 3% yesterday. Then we have modest gains of about half a percentage point for feed of cattle futures, while live cattle futures gained a little over quarter of a percent. When we talk about grains, we have a pullback in oats, a modest one, Considering the recent rally, oats futures were down around 1.5%. Likewise, we have modest losses for canola and soybean meal. On the other hand, massive gains for soybean oil, closing the day with gains of over 3.5%. Likewise, we have positive activities for soybeans, corn, wheat, rough rice, all closing in the green today. The bottom line is, folks, there is no peak inflation here. Moving on, the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? At number one, the hottest table by far was PBR, Petrobras. This is a Brazilian refinery, and of course, they're paying dividend, and therefore, you have a lot of shareholders selling upside calls. This is standard procedure, by the way, indicating that the name could pull back starting tomorrow. In this case, almost 2.5 million contracts traded for the name. About 99% of those were calls. At a number two, Apple. At around 900,000 contracts traded for the name today, about 58% of those were calls. At a number three, Tesla, the souffle. At around 700,000 contracts, about 56% of those were calls. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, we start with the ticker ATER. This is sort of a meme stock, if you may. It was a hot stock last year, but it has since crashed. Somebody's bidding on a rebound here. It is a volatile name. I wouldn't be involved in it, but sometimes you get squeezes, short squeezes in this name, and we see sizable gains just like we got today. Somebody's bidding for more gains to come by buying the six bucks calls for the expiration date, April 22nd, with the expectations. The name could move higher by more than 6% by then, and they paid around 85 cents apiece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $700,000. What about the trade for the ticker XRT? Now, the premium for this trade is really wide so if you want to bet against or for the xrt in this case against you gotta pick another trade but the moral of the story is we got a decent rebound in the xrt today the retail etf but somebody is fading the rip by buying puts in this case they're buying the 73 puts for the expiration date april 22nd with expectations the xrt could go down by more than five percent by then they paid around two and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around one and a half million dollars. What about the ticker at the bottom of the table, CZR, Caesars Entertainment, Las Vegas? All of the casino stocks moved higher today, leading the gains. And of course, they say it is the reopening optimism. It is uh, Las Vegas said something. It is the peak inflation optimism. It, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Today was the day when they bought the dip in casinos and the shorts covered for whatever reason doesn't matter at the end of the day when you have a recession warning in the horizon these are some of the first names that get hit in the economy casinos so whatever rebound we have right now you can ride it higher you ride the wave but sooner or later when these charts get closer to technical reversals for example you take your profits and you bet the other way in this case they're riding the wave higher by betting for more gains for caesars they bought the 75 calls for the expiration date may 20th with expectations the name could move higher by more than seven percent by then they paid around three bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker arkk this is for tesla witch kathy wood they're buying calls here, betting for more gains, more of the same of what we got today. And in this case, they bought the 66 calls for the expiration date, April 29th. With the expectations, the name could move higher by more than 7% by then. They paid around one buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $600,000. And what about the trade for the ticker PNC for, you guessed it, 
PNC. The name is reporting earnings tomorrow. We got disastrous earnings from JP Morgan today. And of course, somebody's hedging now by buying the 160 puts for the expiration date, May 20th. With expectations, the name could go down by more than 10% by then. They paid around one buck and 65 cents a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $800,000. What about the trade for the ticker XOP? This is the oil ETF. This is an interesting one because they're betting that oil would go down by buying the 130 puts for the expiration date, June 17th. But a reminder, it could also be a hedging kind of trade. Somebody owns the XOP and they're buying insurance. And they're expecting that the XOP could go down by more than 9% by then. They paid around 5 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $2 million. What about the trades for the ticker? MRVL Marvel. I used to like the name, not anymore. At least since last year, the fourth quarter of last year, I became bearish on MRVL Marvel. And here we have somebody's betting for more declines to come for the name. By opening a put spread, they bought the 60 bucks puts and they sold the 50 bucks, all for the expiration date, May 13th. With expectations that Marvell could go down by more than 5% by then, but now more than 21%. They paid around 2 bucks a piece by opening the 60 bucks puts, and they received about 40 cents a piece in credit by opening the 50 bucks puts. All in all, the entry cost for this trade is around 1 buck and 60 cents a piece, and all in all, the bet is around $500,000. And lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker COOP for Mr. Cooper, an old school insurance company, excuse me, a loan finance company for mortgages and residential properties. Somebody's buying calls here, the 45 calls for the expiration date, May 20th. With expectations, the name could move higher by more than 6% by then. They paid around 2 bucks a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $600,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis, unfortunately, there is nothing notable to see here. It was the tide that lifted all boats. Of course, we have notable losers that we have to talk about. Number one, ABV, the ticker ABBV. Lots of pain recently. Number one, we have dividends about to be paid. Number two, we have a resignation from one of the executives and again, the name was overbought to begin with, technically speaking. The year-to-date gains for this name are absolutely insane, so it is rational to see a pullback after such massive gains. We talked about the expectations for the pullback in this program before the week even started. Likewise, we have the ticker INFY emphasis in semiconductors. The name is down big today because it appears that this is another treasonous company that sold sensitive data to China. And I say, what is the big deal, right? You have Apple doing the same on a mass scale and nothing happened to the stock. And then we have JPM, JP Morgan down big. And by the way, we need an entire video to cover JP Morgan's earnings. Lots of bombs a lot to unpack there. And Jamie Dimon, by the way, who's usually a pumper, a perma bull, he sounds more cautious by the day. He sees something here. And if you read between the lines of what he said, it gets really scary. Likewise, PayPal was a loser for the day. And the reason is the CFO, the chief financial officer, left for Walmart. And now we have all these speculations that the CFO left because he sees trouble in PayPal's earnings. So Walmart was up big, PayPal down big. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs, a lot of pain for the inverse indices, the VIX proxies, but besides that, it's a sea of green across the board. There is nothing to read here. Both energy, for example, was up, XOP, XLE, OIH, along with chips, technology, biotech. It is the tide that lifts all boats. The low volume rally, which was led by growth, by the way, growth at performing value, be it both of them are in the green. Likewise, when we look at international markets, for example, all in the green for the most part, and when we look at commodities, look at the URA, uranium. Uranium was up almost 3.5% today alone. And by the way, a name that I own and I talked about in this program not so long ago, the ticker UAC, UAC, excuse me, it was up almost 14% today alone. So the uranium bulls are having a good time. We also have natural gas, UNG, up big over 5% today. And we talked about natural gas, the momentum in natural gas, also in this program in a previous video. Moving on to charts, and we start with SPY, 30, excuse me, an hourly chart this time around. What do we see here? The volume was down all in all. 
and the algos, the dip buyers, decided that 438 is a good place to rebound from. It wasn't a big rebound to begin with, it was a recapture of 443 as support, but the chart didn't even make it to the highs of yesterday. So for now, it is a rebound, it was kind of expected because we talked about the low volume rally after the CPI, and probably we could see another rally in tomorrow's session because the assumption is it's going to be a low volume one. But it looks weak, it looks pathetic, it's going to look a lot better if the bulls manage to close the gap at around 447. If that happened by the end of the week, meaning tomorrow, then the bulls will have a solid case to say we got the bottom, we stabilized the chart, and now we gotta wait for the earnings storm. Whatever earnings show, the charts will follow. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. The good news for the bulls is they're keeping 4,384 and a half as support. This is the good news. The bad news is it came on the heels of low volume, as expected, of course. Is it a problem for the bulls right now? No, it's not. It is a good development. And the reason is we have theories out there. For example, another YouTuber pointed out that, that this could be a bull flag consolidation. I disagree, but let's assume it is. That theory would go out of the window the moment the chart loses 4,384 and a half. So it is a critical line for the bulls to keep if you're following the bull flag theory. Moving on to the SPX, the cash index for the SPY. It's a green day, but still below the 200 days moving average, and the weekly closing becomes really important. Are the bulls going to close above the 200 days moving average or below? Furthermore, the bulls have a lot of repair to do here in this chart. They have at least two gaps that they have to close above, besides the 200 days moving average. For now, we have negative divergences in both the RSI and MACD indicators, but they're firming up a little bit. They're kind of curling their way higher. Could we see another rally in tomorrow's session and the bulls closing above the 200 days moving average? It is possible, specifically under low volume. So the bulls must take advantage of that and close the week above the 200 days moving average. That would kind of restore the confidence among the bull community. Moving on to the Qs, an hourly chart once again. The chart managed to recapture 343 on low volume as we talked about in yesterday's video. Now here's the problem. The chart didn't close the gap above and it doesn't appear that we have a lot of conviction in buying the dip today. The good news for the bulls is the following. They got and recaptured 343 as support. It counts, folks. It doesn't matter how you do it. It counts for now. The problem becomes the sustainability of trading above 343 for, let's say, next week when the volume comes back. For now, the support is 343, the resistance at around 352. But we have a gap above at around 350, let's say, 349, it has to be closed. So let's say we have an upside day tomorrow, right off the gate. We gotta watch how the chart behaves at around that gap. Will it close the gap and then pull back again? That would be an ominous sign. The chart would lose 343 once again. But if the chart closes the gap, and most importantly, closes the gap for the day and trades above the gap, by the closing and the next destination will be 352 and at least the bulls can breathe a sigh of relief that they got 343 as support for now and here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the nasdaq the good news is the critical support of 14,000 has been restored the problem is it has been restored under low volume as you can see for now can we see another pop higher and perhaps the chart recapturing 14,445 as support? That would be ideal for the bulls. When they hand you these opportunities of extreme readings on the technicals, for example, up or down, doesn't matter, or they give you these low volume days, you gotta take advantage of those days and make as much progress as you can, be it the bulls or the bears. In this case, the advantage is for the bulls because they got the low volume week, the short and trading week, and there is a possibility that they could move higher and recapture 14,445. And then let's say next week the volume comes back and we see a lot of earnings and perhaps a lot of pain. Now the bulls have built some cushion here and the cushion is 14,445 because losing 14,000 will be the end of all hopes for the bulls. Number one, they lose the reverse head and shoulder theory. Number two, they lose the ABC pattern theory. So it is critically important for the bulls to keep 14,000 as support. And here is the IWM, an hourly chart 
start for the Russell 2000. The good news is the IWM rebounded and kept 196 and a half as support. The problem is we have another challenge above, which is the highs of yesterday's session at around 201.68. It appears for now the chart did not make it all the way there, but the expectations are the chart will meet stiff resistance at that point. Will it make it above? If it does, we have a gap at around 203. That must be closed. We will watch the behavior of the chart at around that number, around that gap. Will it close the gap and pull back? That's not good. Will it close the gap and close the day above the gap? That is good news for the bulls. But for now, watch out 201.68. And most importantly, 196 and a half. You lose that support, goodbye. We will see a flush down. You keep that support, you got the hope alive. But it's going to be one step at a time. Number one, 201.68. Number two, the gap at around two of 203, excuse me, and then the resistance at 204 and a half. Moving on to the Dixie, the dollar index, it appears that we have a pullback for now. Is it a top? Who knows? But it is a big pullback. We have yet to receive the confirmation. The confirmation could happen tomorrow, for example, by another flush down in the Dixie. Or we could see that clearly in the momentum indicators if we have the negative divergences restored. And for now, they are at least on the RSI. Soon enough, we could get a confirmation from the MACD of the negative divergence of the RSI. And if the dollar is going to go down, it is good news for equities, specifically the multinational corporations, because you're going to hear this earnings season that the rise of the dollar took down margins, at least from the international revenue. So if the dollar goes down, good news for multinational equities, number one. Number two, good news for commodities. And therefore, we're seeing commodities moving higher, be it oil, be it gold. Yep, gold moved higher. And by the way, there was a viewer, before we talk about gold, there was a viewer who commented yesterday and said something about the U.S. dollar. Why do you think that inflation is moving higher along with the U.S. dollar moving higher too? It's a good question, but it requires a lengthy answer. I'm already running out of time here, so I'm going to reserve the answer for another video. But rest assured, I did not forget about your question. But here's gold. Gold moving higher. Steady Eddie. No problems here. We might meet some resistance at around 2,000, but one step at a time for now. If the dollar continues to go down along with the 10-year yield, good news for gold. And also good news for oil. Look at oil. This is a 4 hours chart. It rebounded from 100, and it recaptured 105.84. For now, on the 4 hours chart, it is getting a little extended on the RSI so we could keyword could get a pullback but for now folks they threw the kitchen sink on this chart by the release of the SPR by the propaganda by yada 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 and the chart rebounded either way this is good news for gold and here is the most terrifying chart for the Biden administration by the way this is a daily chart for Brent once again, we have a sloping line of resistance, and then we have a double bottom for now, and the momentum indicators are not overbought at all. Sooner or later, we could see a breakout and an explosion higher in oil. Watch out here for all of you, the peak inflation crowd. And here is the chart of the day, the chart of the week, the chart of the month, the 10-year yield. Is it topping? You cannot say that with certainty. Yes, the technicals are over, overbought, excuse me, overextended. I don't like the terms overbought and oversold, by the way, but it is what it is. But do we have a legitimate reversal here? Do we have a clear signal that this is over? You cannot say that with conviction because all of this pullback that we got in the last two days or so only erased one day worth of gains. That's all there is. So you cannot say with conviction that this is over. And of course, we're watching bank earnings. We got JP Morgan today. Tomorrow, we're going to get more. We're going to get uh, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, US Bank, and many others. And this chart will be impacted, by the way, by these earnings from bank banks. It's going to be a double whammy on these bank earnings if they bomb the earnings, just like we saw with JP Morgan today. And if the 10-year yield also goes down and we see re-flattening and perhaps re-inversion of the yield curve, we could see massive pain in banks. But we'll take it one step at a time. Here is the TLT, a mini small rebound on the weekly chart. Yes, it is getting oversold, a term that I don't like, but it is what it is. When will the rebound happen? We have a lot of gaps above that should be closed. We'll know when we know, folks. We're not going to fight it right now. We're not going to buy calls on the TLT right now. We got to see more. Show me the money. Convince me. The 10-year yield is topping. And this will only happen if the TLT recaptures 128 support. If that happens, we have a clear reversal in the 10-year yield. There's going to be plenty of meat in the bone to chew on. And here's the VIX, a 4-hour 
first chart, the VIX appears to be topping for now, at least for this week. It met stiff resistance at around 24.29 over and over and over again. And now we have the momentum indicators, the MACD indicator confirming a little bit of weakness. We're starting to see red impressions on the histogram. So let's say the bulls have a field day tomorrow because of low volume or whatever, the peak inflation stability. We could see the VIX going down all the way to 20. The question is, will the bears defend 20 as support? For the VIX, that becomes critically important for a weekly closing. Will the chart close above 20 or below 20? Above 20 keeps the hope alive for market bears that once the volume comes back, we will see the sell-off resuming. A closing below 20, on the other hand, gives the bulls a lot of hope that we're not seeing a lot of hedging. We've seen multiple opportunities for people to hedge and buy puts, and they did not. And we're already getting closer to earnings season, the heart of earnings season. So it gives the bulls the vote of confidence that we're not seeing fear anymore in the market. If anything, we're seeing anticipation of above expectations earnings, and we could see a rally after we get earnings. It is wishful thinking, in my opinion, but it is what it is. The psychology is important, folks. Here is the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ, four hours chart. We're about to get confirmation from the MACD indicator that the VXN has topped, at least for now, and we will know when we get red impressions on the histogram of the MACD. But we already got a confirmation, in my opinion, by losing 27.5 as support. The question is, will the chart close the week above 27 and a half or below this number. For now, it appears that the NASDAQ bulls are getting the advantage at least for tomorrow's session. And here is Apple, the king of the NASDAQ, the most important name, and it is making progress. It rebounded higher, on low volume of course, and it recaptured the trend line of support. The next destination will be 172.4, and after that we'll be closing the gap at around 176, one step at a time. I don't think 172.4 will be easy to break above. A rejection from 172.4 and a pullback will be a shorting signal for Apple. And here is Tesla, an hourly chart for the souffle. An important progress today because we have a recapture of 995. The problem is, we have a gap at around 1025, 1025. Just like we talked with the IWM's chart, would this be the resistance, the stiff resistance, the goal of closing the gap and then a pullback and losing 995 as support once again? If that happened, this will be a green light to short the name at least all the way down to let's say 950. If the bulls, however, manage to close the day by tomorrow, closing the week above the gap, above 1,025 will be a major victory for the bulls. It could take them all the way back to 1,090 and a half. What about Bitcoin? Tulips, what's going on here? We have a rebound, but we're still below 42,000. So we're not buying here. We need to see more risk on kind of confidence. And this will be evident by a move higher in the NASDAQ, the RKKs of the world, a pullback in commodities, for example, buying of meme stocks. All of these are confirmation signals for risk on, which will give us the green light to buy BT if it closes above 42,000 once again. And here it is, AMC. This is an hourly chart, I believe. It could be actually, two, yeah, it is an hourly chart. I thought it was a two hours chart. It is an hourly. The support at 14.24, the resistance at around 21. But the momentum indicators are bottoming. They're shaping the saucer bottom, not just on the chart, but also on the momentum indicators. Today, I bought AMC calls. Let's zoom in to a three minutes chart. What I like to see in charts when we talk about bottoms, at least from a trading perspective, is a gap down, a sharp pullback in the morning right away that is met by a lot of buying and the chart reverses right away. This is exactly what we saw today in AMC's chart. Once again, this is a three minutes chart. It opened right off the gate with a massive pullback. And then we got, you see these candles, the red candle, the massive pullback in the morning. And then we got the reversal with a massive green candle higher, back in the green. Right there and then I got my signal to buy calls. You didn't have to rush you didn't have to buy right away, say yesterday. You could have done what I did and waited for the signal to buy. And even after that, look at these gains. The chart gained almost 5% from that point on. The gains on calls are even better. The moral of the story is, even if you wait for a confirmation, even if you're too late to the move, you can score big. There's a lot of meat in the bone to chew on. And for now, let's say if we get to 20, for example, by the end of the week, meaning tomorrow for AMC, I would be closing those calls and moving on. This is not a call that AMC will go back to the moon, by the way. This is a call for a short-term trade. And so far, so good. 
Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have a lot. We have the initial jobless claims, and then we have retail sales. We also have the import price index, along with the consumer sentiment index from uh, University of Michigan that comes hand in hand with the five years inflation expectations. And then we have business inventories, along with more Fed zombies speaking, Loretta Mister from Cleveland and Patrick Harker from Philadelphia. On the earnings calendar, we have Goldman Sachs, and we have other banks, by the way, P and C, Citibank. This will be important to watch because Citi has a lot of uh, exposure to Russia, and JP Morgan got hit hard by the Russian affiliation. So watch out here. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.